I think we've got some room for development here. <laughs> Have you got a group of people? Thank you very much. Your challenge is this. Please find out from your colleagues what they reckon it is, and more importantly, what's it got to do with adaptive leadership in Gippsland Water? Good luck, you have three minutes. What is it, and what's it got to do with adaptive leadership? So, the two questions, what is it, and what's it got to do with adaptive leadership, were the invitation to actually start a process, and I observed something really interesting. You came and got it. You came and got it and started to experiment with it. How, how, how did you go? Got it once. Yeah, got it once. Got it. <laughs> oh, I see. There are plenty of spectators who were, <laughs> who were making decisions about how good you are. Well, guess what? In this program, there's going to be a lot of people observing. What are you developing? What are you changing? What are you working on? So there is going to be that feedback from outside. I saw a smug look creep onto your face. <laughs> a smug look when you too scored a, a, a home run. Yes, yes. <laughs> what was interesting for me was that it was almost, oh good, I've done that, I retire. What do you notice about this instrument of torture? There are different aspects to it. There's this big scoop, which we can bounce it on, and that might be a managerial challenge, a leadership challenge, that is relatively easy to achieve. So you keep working at it, practicing it, developing the competencies to get that result. But then you notice that there's a scoop here, and another smaller scoop, and then of course you notice that. I think that's where I've got that one. <laughs> that, that's called magical thinking, sometimes also called delusion. Delusion. So please, my adaptive leaders, retreat to your seats. But here is the opportunity, as a metaphor, for us to recognise the adaptive program is truly a learning and development program. It's in no way a training program. I'm a veterinarian by original training. I did 12 years as a full-time vet, the last part of which was travelling on sheep ships to the Middle East. And we will perhaps explore some stories related to my discoveries in that field. It came to a shuddering halt here in 1987 when my employer and I had a major falling out over the live sheep export trade. My professional opinion was that the trade was inhumane and should be stopped. The department's, my uh, employer's view was that it should be supported and so we didn't have a lot of room to manoeuvre. Except that they invited me to undertake re-education, for which I'm eternally grateful. This moment in time, which extended to two and a half years, was very like your six months development program you're about to embark on. It was an opportunity for me to come face to face with the, what I wasn't doing particularly successfully in that phase of my career. And since 1990, I've been a full-time facilitator, mediator, and executive coach, working with groups like GW to increase the uptake of skills that work. So if I draw a little diagram here, and describe this as the level you are within GW, within your organisation, and the percentage of time that you spend in these three areas of activity, 
how do you, does your day, your week, your month stack up in relation to this? For my adaptive leadership cohort, I'm presuming you're about here in the hierarchy, which says you should be devoting approximately 40% of your time to people matters, approximately 20% of your time to technical or task matters, and about 40% of your time to strategic matters. The linking of, as Sarah said, roles to direction, roles to strategy. How do, how do you stack up with that notion? Depends on the situation. That's that's a good answer. Yep. Other reactions? How do you stack up? And it's a notional thing about 40, 20, 40 at this level within the organisation. I'll be much more talkative by the end of the program. <coughs> Promise. Much more forthright. I think it's probably more in the task. task. Mm. Thanks for your reflection, because this program is going to be constantly about think, plan, do, and reflect. The most successful adult learning model is one where we combine all three of these things, think, plan, do, reflect. So your reflection is, gee whiz, yeah, probably more in the task. And I would be very surprised if it's not. Because most frequently, when Lynn and I work with, uh, with people, we start to get an answer that looks a bit like this. I got promoted to this level because I was really good at the job. I was fabulous at the job, in fact. So I got promoted and now I find myself still being fabulous at the job. Trouble is, this other area of how do I get results with and through my people, <coughs> and how do I link what we're doing to where we want to be organisationally, suddenly becomes a deficit. So how do many of us compensate? Oh, that's easy. We take it home at the weekend. Or we stay back later. Which isn't a fix, because now life balance is starting to be distorted. So we've got a real challenge to get this to start to operate in a more balanced and effective way. Sarah mentioned the DISC profile, a situational behavioural model, which gives you some insights, an opportunity to re reflect not only on your style, but on the style of your people, on the style of your managers, on the style of your peers and how to adjust and adapt accordingly. Maybe that will help here. The GENOS, Emotional Intelligence Model, gives you an opportunity to get feedback from some colleagues in terms of how do you perceive your emotions and your ability to work with your emotions and how do they perceive it? Because often there can be a significant mismatch. We're going to have the workshops and they probably represent 10% of the learning that's going to happen in this program. 20% of the learning is going to be in processes involving coaching, engagement with specific others to start to build application into the workplace. Because look, we can do the theory of how to do this, but what I actually need is some direct engagement, just coach me in how to do it. The theory alone won't do it. And then the 70% will come from the just-in-time application on the job. And I haven't checked in with you, Sarah, so I'd better check in now if this is all right. This could be, this could be a sticking point. Other Sarah, this could be the end of the gig. How do you react, 
please, to the probability that the adaptive leadership cohort will from time to time make mistakes in applying the things that we're learning about. And how is that, how is that for you? For me it's opportunity as long as people are flexible. I, I, I love that learning sort of culture, so a mistake suddenly is, it's only, it's only an issue if you haven't learned from it. The mistake becomes a blunder if I keep doing it over and over. If I make a mistake and I learn from it and adjust and start to flex and adapt, that's learning. Can I get you all please to fuck you're already there. You're already there. Okay, you've seen enough, I can see. Look at it. Can I get you all to fold your arms, please, and fold them tightly? <laughs> Lock them up. Lock them up. It's comfortable. <laughs> oh, I see that. The defensive response already. <laughs> In Body Language 101 textbooks, the poorer quality, a whole lot of meaning is ascribed to arm folds. From my point of view, an arm folded is an arm folded. That's not what I wanted to check out. This is what I wanted to check out. Please. Hold your arms and check out which forearm is on top. It'll be a right forearm or a left forearm. <laughs> if there's anything else on top, come and see me later. <laughs> Remember which forearm's on top and please now unfold your arms and do a little bit of deaf <coughs> clapping. Oh, they said, what's deaf clapping? Thanks, Reza's with it. <laughs> the hearing impaired community does jazz hands for applauding their hearing impaired colleagues. Thank you very much. Refold your arms, other arm on top, go. Other arm, other arm. Now, here's interesting stuff. In the adaptive program, we're not only going to be learning by reflecting on ourselves, we're going to learn by watching and engaging with each other. I'm seeing a couple of players over here working out, now how do I do that? <laughs> If you manage to get there, the other arm on top, how does it feel? Strange, uncomfortable, odd, uh, or impossible? <laughs> no, no, they, they got, got it for me. They, they wrestled it into place. And therein lies a very simple metaphor of change. What? Does change generate for many of us? It generates discomfort. And with that discomfort, with looking at a different way to manage and lead people, what's the tendency? What's the tendency with your arm fold? I can promise you. What will you want to do? Go back. Go back to what you've known. So our journey over this next six months is going to be stepping from a known zone towards an unknown zone, and as you stretch that unknown zone, as you stretch into it, it becomes known. For many years I used to call this the comfort zone and the uncomfort zone, and I realised the stupidity. Because I actually know a lot of people who, under their current circumstances, are in their known zone and very uncomfortable. They don't like the space they're in. Uh, I didn't like the angry ant that I was here, but I didn't have any options to do anything different. This gave me the chance. We're going to have guest speakers come and talk to us in the various sessions. We're going to have coaching circles where we will get into subgroups from the cohort of 15 adaptive leaders and we'll work together on specific work-based problems and the conversation will be entirely confidential. My commitment to you as participants is that when we apply the Chatham House rule to our discussions, what's said in the room stays in the room. Because what I want to build is a climate of trust that we can get real with each other that we can get real with each other and start to 
to applaud our successes and equally applaud our failures until we become able to do the leadership that we want to do for the benefit of Gippsland Water. Our program will be fun. It'll be hard work and it'll be fun. It may involve games, even. But I don't suspect, Lynn, that this is any game. This is actually probably really serious. Did you know this has a name? It's called Ken Dummer. And I discovered with fascination that the first World Cup of Ken Dummer was convened in 2017. So now we have a World Cup sport with Ken Dummer. <laughs> I think Lynn has a <coughs> challenge right now. Absolutely. All right. Thank you um, very much, Rob. Um, in, our, in our programs, we have a lot of activities, which I thought we'd do one today. We have a lot of activities, and there's always bribery and corruption in my programs that I don't know. Do you bribe and corrupt? I call it other things. Okay. <laughs> right. okay. I'm a bit more honest. Okay, so I thought we'd do one of these activities uh, right now. So if I do it now, I of course can't do it in the program. But every day there's multiple of these types of things that we do. And they're fun and they're short and there's always a major learning part that comes out of it because we're always looking at human behaviour and how you react to certain things and how then that gets translated into the workplace. So I would like, and we can't all play this because we've got too many here at the moment, but I would like, uh, how many tables? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, if I could have three people from each table um, sort of come out to the front, please. In this exercise, I'm going to give the ball to Adam. Now, I'll set you up first with this exercise. You have to, just have to be in a position where you can actually see each other. So you probably need to be somewhat in a circle. Oh, sorry. Adam, can you throw it? to someone around the room, please. Yeah. 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 So if you could throw the ball of your choice in the circle. Excellent. Now throw it to someone who hasn't had the ball before. Who would you like to throw it to? Now, when we have exercises like that, that will come always main learning points. So a couple of things we picked up first off. Sarah started off by talking about goals. Now, we did that exercise three times, and then I said, if you can beat Rob's Lead Crackles, we get a dip in the chocolate box. And immediately, what did everyone do? Let's go. You tried to beat World's Best Practice four times, and we didn't even know what World's Best Practice was. Did anyone even think, what are we trying to beat? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that um, when we've got goals in my head as the leader of that exercise, Everyone had a different impression on what world's best practice was. And so we think, well, if they didn't understand what was needed, why didn't they ask? Your team members will never ask what their <coughs> expectations are because they're operating to a certain drum, a certain beat that has been set by previous leaders or, or themselves, any of their world experiences and life experiences. So you've got a pretty clear goal in mind as to what the standard is that needs to be achieved or the time frame, the turnaround, that type of thing. And they will never ask. Like we've got a group of people here that are above intelligent and no one ever said to me, what are we actually trying to beat? We were so busy, excited, let's do it. So we did it a few times and then I offered, it's five seconds. What was the immediate reaction when I said world's best practice is five seconds? Oh, it's not going to work. Not going to work. Oh, no way. Then we started to come around. What happened as we started to come around? What brought us around? The challenge. The, uh, the challenge. Some, uh, one person, I think, oh, it was a guy in a blue suit in a shirt. Someone said, well, can we move? It only needs one person to challenge the status quo, because you did it three times, this is where I stand, this is where we stand, it's not going to break those rules, someone then thought outside the box and said, can we move? 
And I said, right, let's go over the rules. And then there was a creative frenzy after that. It's really interesting. Everyone sticks to the normal, the routine that um, Rob was talking about. And as soon as someone challenges it, it's like an opening of the floodgates for everyone to challenge it. And then it becomes really noisy, it becomes very busy, <coughs> ideas come out and flow. And a more creative personality style is the one that's more likely to challenge the status quo. And then it moves from there and evolves, and then we did the exercises, and then we came up with, well, why don't we do this? A very radical thinking. Before that, we were just going to do it faster. Okay, well, let's try something else. Now, if I let you play for another 10 minutes, we would have got there in the end. Can <coughs> anyone think of how we could have got there in five seconds? Yeah, it was, how what? Just make a cup and pull your hands together and roll it down. Well, yes, that's one way. We may have got, our, our limitation was the number of people were playing. If we only had eight, you'd be able to do it that way. Anyone else got a creative idea on that? Yeah. And how can we get five seconds? It's that chairs and then you keep going down faster. You could move past the grading. We're all now stuck on the grading. Think outside the grading. Um, all hands touch the ball together, one together. Yes. Or just have your hands open like that. Everyone get into the circle. And Adam couldn't do it because they had to leave his hand. So it went to the next one, just sorted that out. And they could just run around and then take it back to Adam's hand. You would have got that in five seconds. Another way would have been to all stand really close together in the line, put your hands up in the air, and throw from one person to another. You would have done that for about two seconds. So the creativity process works and it evolves. And we have a look at this whole process when we do continuous improvement. We can use that exercise in so many applications as to what is human behaviour. And I use it because Sarah mentioned about goals, is that your team members will never ask what the expectations are. Like you did. You didn't ask what the expectations are. You were too busy trying to do it. So it's really interesting. Um, so we've got heaps of little exercises like this. There will always be a major learning point coming from it. And it's, we never like to think that anyone gets embarrassed or you know, that um, sort of they feel bad over it. We are looking at human behaviour and there's so much to gain and it's so fun. It's so much more of a, a fun way of um, working through it. Yeah. Any, any questions or comments on that? All right, excellent. So what we're doing. <coughs> the first thing that's going to happen is that we are going to survey your team. So you'll be um, given the opportunity of, um, I just need to explain this, given the opportunity of nominating who you would like to get feedback from. Now I take this really seriously in you select, not your, your best mate who might be working with you. I also discourage anyone that might be on a performance improvement plan. Now you're not going to get good feedback from that person and it's not valuable feedback for you. And so you can choose who you want to get the feedback from so an address will send an email, nominate those people, who you're quite happy to get feedback from. If you've got three, four, five people, that's all good. Uh, and then we send them an email and they respond to that survey and we provide that feedback as far as your leadership style. And all those elements relate to the program that <coughs> we're looking at. So you're gonna get a really good slice of what you do really well and areas that we could improve. <coughs> Now, if we're aligning that to this, like there's four personality styles, four basic personality styles, and good leadership qualities come from all four. Come from all four, equally, from all four. So it makes sense then, when you've got a different sort of, um, preference in your personality style, you're going to have certain natural strengths as a leader. And then there are going to be other areas where you are not strong at because it's not part of your personality style. So it's not as though, gee, oh, well, that was leadership. It's just that, okay, let's get some alerts as things I can now consciously do to strengthen my style. So that's why we want valid feedback from your direct report. So if you've got someone that's really difficult in your team, I will be putting their name on that um, the survey document. Uh, I'm leaving that choice to yours. It's just it's going to skew results and you're not going to get a really good slice of how it's being seen. And I had one in a, a course a few weeks ago, and I went into the performance improvement. <coughs> so it, it just doesn't play for the center. 
And they said, oh, but I thought I needed to be fair to all team members. Mm. Okay, at the end of the day, this is about your development, so let's give us some um, valuable feedback. So we constantly then um, keep looking at that. Um, we set up action plans of what we could do, and each one of these areas will give us some more techniques as to how to lift that. So our first day is creating an inspiring environment. Like how do people, you know, things that we can do to really engage people into the same order. Then, as Rob said, we have our coaching circles, and this is where we will divide into three groups, and we have two hours. Um, and so you only have two hours on that second day, and we talk about how all the application plans went, and are there any issues in your team that you would like to run past the other group to come up with some ideas as to how to improve it. With those coaching circles, we can't change. When you nominate on day one as to which coaching circle and what time frame you're in, <coughs> you can't then change in midway because the, the group becomes quite sort of supportive and as soon as there's a new member in it, it tends to distort all the dynamics. So um, I will put out a, a, a schedule and you can elect as to which sort of coaching circle you, you want to go in. After that, we look at continuous improvement and implementing change. Those two are, are closely related. Then we have time management and managing and customer service. So how do we get ourselves organised and how do we actually uh, look at our service levels for internal and external customers? <coughs> so if you're not serving an external customer, you're serving internal customers. So we've got to get all that. So we're going to look at a fabulous model which analyses where our service levels are and how we can improve. And coaching circles again, advanced communication skills on how to negotiate out issues with um, other internal people, external people. Coaching circles again, and then we look at coaching staff to get the best out of them, to help them reach full potential, and of course also what happens when we've got um, someone who's under the line. <laughs> and what, how do we manage that, and what are unfair dismissal laws, and what are the disciplinary processes within um, the flat water. Then we've got our project presentation. So in our continuous improvement and implementing change, we'll find ourselves into groups, and we will have a project to implement. Any leader can lead an ex a team as to how they're operating at the moment. A great leader is able to implement positive change make things better. So in a team we're looking at how to uh, implement a project and manage that project through completion. Because quite often we start things and then we don't finish them. They fall beside the way. So our team is going to be working with the guidance of your um, continuous improvement team to work through a project. So down in November we will come back and we uh, then have an opportunity of delivering our project outcomes, and it will only be a small time frame. You're certainly not going to be out there doing a presentation for 30 minutes. It might only be about 10 minutes, the whole team doing that presentation. All right, and then we, um, in December, we're going to re survey the staff and see has there actually been a shift. So we are seriously looking at trying to help you strengthen your leadership style, try something new, as what was said. Have a little sand pit over there. Let's have a go at this. Let's try this. Let's see what the reaction was like. Um, and then we come back and we talk about it. So lots of opportunity to try something new, work outside that comfort zone, and strengthen your own style. All right, any questions about the actual content? All right, so, well, I'm happy with that. What's the time? Um, have a look. Oh, What's the time Okay, all right. Okay. Um, I'm really hoping I reiterate what Rob was saying as far as trying something new, working outside the comfort zone. Um, but our coaching circles also encourage you to discuss anything, not just what was related to the course or our application exercises, because we'll always have little mini skills. Like here, uh, a, a, a strong inspiring <coughs> activity is delegation. And so we have a look at how to delegate. And then you'll be asked in the session to come up with an action plan as to who you're going to delegate, when you're going to do it, and what topic you're going to do it to. And so it's the start of a conversation here. 
However, if there is a more pressing matter in your team at that point of time, we can talk about that. So you can certainly guide as to what you is going to give you the best outcome. And often then we'll follow up in the next coaching circle, how did that go? So it's a real smorgasbord of activities as far as um, options, let's try that, that can work, let's try this. So it's a, a smorgasbord, a toolkit, and take what you can. All right, any questions? All right, well, Rob said that he was that by qualification, by qualification, I'm an accountant. Have we got any accountants in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Eight years. <laughs> Eight years specialising in tax law. So it was, a very, it was a very big change in my career. So I've been having the pleasure of presenting and facilitating now for over 30 years. So I did have, have identified the error of my decision when I was in high school to move into it into accounting. So there's a you know, very practical side of growth as well. Yeah. All right, okay. I've, um, have you finished? So I'm passing over. Back to you. Yeah, I'll just...